Have you ever wandered into a facility and taken a look at the layout and, and asked yourself the question, was there any method to the madness? Um, laying out facilities is really a non-trivial exercise or non-trivial activity. Sometimes how a facility is actually laid out has strategic implications. In some cases, it might just be to help to reduce costs, improve information flow, and so forth. But how one lays out a given facility can be a very important decision that has to be made. So when you walk into a supermarket, how that is laid out, there are particular reasons for that. How McDonald's is actually laid out, there are particular reasons for that. Um, you go to an airport, how that's located and how that's laid out, there are also reasons for that. So no matter where you go, you go to your uh, local um, staples, there's also a reason for how it's actually laid out. If you look at McDonald's, you'll see that McDonald's have done a number of innovations over the years. Added indoor seating, drive through windows, breakfast menu, play areas, and so forth. Um, all of these um, innovations, a number of them actually have to do with layout. So indoor seating has to do with layout. drive through window has to do with layout. Um, play areas have to do with layout. Um, the redesign of the kitchen have to do with a layout in the, in the back here. And then um, you have self-service uh, kiosks. Adding that, would, you would have to sort of kit in your layout design or layout plan for that. And three separate dining sections. Six out of the seven were layout decisions. If you look <clears throat> now what's it, what it's doing, there's a seventh major innovation where it's redesigning 30,000 outlets around the world offering three separate dining areas. A linger zone, kind of like a cafe to compete with your Starbucks and so forth. With comfortable chairs and Wi-Fi connections. Grab and go zone where folks just want to sit at a tall uh, chair, at a table, eat and run. And then you have a flexible zone for kids and families where the kids could play while the families are dining. Uh, so facility layout, McDonald's clearly sees that as influencing its ability to attract customers. So layout is actually playing a strategic role in enabling McDonald's competitive advantage. So the objective of layout strategy is to develop an effective and efficient layout that will meet a firm's competitive requirements. So what should we consider when we are laying out a facility? One of the things that we consider about is utilization of space, of course, and equipment and people. If you have a bad layout, you may not be utilizing space appropriately. You also want to ensure that you have effective communication flow, information, materials, and people. That flow has to be managed and ensure that it's done effectively. Um, the design of a facility and the layout of that facility has an impact on employee morale. It has an impact on safety. If you are working in a building that is just beautifully designed, laid out and everything, you feel better about going to work. If everybody's hung up behind a, a cubicle, hidden, uh, with very little space to function, um, with a lot of walking to get work done to transfer either materials or information, then that is a problem. Okay? What are some types of layouts? There are many types of layouts. And they all have the advantages and disadvantages, of course, and they have the applications. So there's your standard office layout, a retail layout, a warehouse layout, a fixed position layout, process, a work cell layout, a product-oriented layout. So we just sort of go through some of those fairly briefly so it give you a sense of that. So in an office, you put people basically based on their relationships. Locate workers requiring frequent contact close to, the, to one another. So based on their relationships in the workspace, you actually would design your layout appropriately. In retail, you have a customer who's walking through and you want to maximize sales. So you want to make sure that your layout will drive sales. So you expose customers to high margin items. In a warehouse, you got to think about the cost of storage and the cost of retrieval. So material handling cost becomes very important. So how you lay that out is all about efficiency, utilization, and cost. 
a project um, kind of uh, layout. Essentially, in this case, you have the the product that's being worked on is fixed, but then you bring equipment and parts to that particular product. For example, in making an airplane, there's no way you could move that airplane around from one workstation to the next. So the airplane is fixed, and then you bring everything that needs to be brought to that airplane is brought to a fixed location. So that's an example of a project-based layout. Okay, same thing like a house. If you're building a house, that's a project. You can't take the house to a bunch of different processes. You bring all the materials and everything to that house. A job shop, if you recall the different types of processes we talked about earlier, well, they have layout implications. So with a job shop now, essentially the facility is laid out based on the processes. So manage varied material flow is what is designed to do because how material flows through a job shop is not necessarily known ahead of time. It depends on what the requirements of that product is. A work cell, essentially, if you have a number of products that are very close in terms of their similarities, then you could put a work cell together that could produce that product, a family. We usually talk about a family. So if you're, you're making, um, say, bicycles, and then you have a few of them of the same size and the same, they use a lot of common parts to them, then clearly you could do those in a work cell. But then if you have now high-end bikes that have some different specs, different materials and so on, that could be produced somewhere else. You have a repetitive focus and a continuous focus where you're either fabricating a product or you're assembling a product. And that requires its own layout um, strategy as well. So in Facilitating good layouts, what are some of the things that you consider? Well, clearly, um, material handling equipment, the capacity and space requirements, the environment and the aesthetics, flows of information and the cost of movement between the various parts of that um, facility. So here's a little expansion on, the, um, on some of the different types of layouts. Office layout, grouping of workers we said already, based on their relationship. So the equipment, space uh, to provide comfort, safety, and movement of information. And that's the main distinction, movement of information. Typically in a state of flux due to frequent technological changes. So you, you find office layouts can be changed um, if you have some techn technological changes that require rewiring or just kind of just put in, uh, or maybe you have a particular CEO or a new person who says, no, I don't like this layout, let's just change it a bit. They have their own ideas about how they would like to see communication and information flow uh, in that facility. One of the things you can do to try to bring people together is if you take all of the people within an office and you draw what we call a relationship chart, um, this kind of shows you how you might be able to develop a layout based on people's interaction. So if you label them A, absolutely necessary, E, essentially important, all the way to X, not desirable, what you can do is uh, pretty much look at, if you look at the CEO, well, A, absolutely necessary. The secretary must be near the CEO. That's very critical. Uh, but E uh, is, um, so you have the chief marketing office in the design area. So they must, they must be, they have to be very close together. So you use that information to help you sort of begin to build a layout of that facility. So it's a fairly good tool to show how you can begin to put the parts together. A supermarket retail layout objective is to maximize profitability per square foot of the floor space. Sales and pr uh, profitability vary with customer exposure. So you want to make sure that you force the customers to move around. And actually, periodically, um, uh, supermarkets will change their layout because what happens is that we become creatures of habit. If we know what the things that we want are, and um, we just sort of go there, and then typically that's what we go to buy, you go to those locations. But to disrupt that behavior, supermarkets will actually redesign the layout or change the location of some of the products to force us to hunt for them and in so doing get exposed to other products. <clears throat> if you're um, considering a supermarket layout, here are some things to think of. Locate hydro items around the periphery of the store so it forces people to go around uh, looking for them. Use prominent locations for high impulse and high margin items. Distribute power items to both sides of an aisle. So it forces you to, um, to move up and down the aisle, right? 
uh, and then uh, dispose them to increase the viewing of other items. So you spread them out. So you don't put them all on one side of the aisle, you put them on both sides, and then it forces you to look around. Uh, use end eye locations as much as possible. End eye locations, so it forces you to go from one end to the next end. And then convey mission of store through careful position of lead off department. Uh, store layout. So that's just an example of, um, you can see dairy products over here, wine and beer, seafood, ethnic food. And different supermarkets sort of lay out differently. But I think those general concepts are sort of carried through a number of them. Uh, what we call service scapes. Uh, these are some things in terms of when you think of services and how do you ensure that you create a kind of a layout that the customers will quite enjoy. So ambient conditions, uh, background characteristics such as lighting, sound, smell, and temperature, spatial layout functionality. So you want to make sure that um, it's very easy for customers to sort of circulate. All right. Uh, how will they walk? Uh, you know, what, what, where are the aisles? And, and uh, you want to make sure that their flow is not interrupted. Um, signs and symbols that basically tell people where things are, so it makes it very easy for them to use that facility. So characteristics of building design that carry social significance. Some of your art, your artifacts, your signs, your symbols, etc. Warehousing. Uh, as we said, that is, a lot of it has to do with making sure that we could... Uh, store and retrieve material very cheaply and we want to maximize utilization. So the objective is to optimize trade-offs between handling costs and the costs associated with the use of the space. Maximize the total cube of the warehouse, which basically means that when the reason why we see cube is that we don't see um, space in two dimensions, we see it in three dimensions. And so that you have to consider your surface area as well as the height and you want to maximize cubic space in a warehouse. And so there are different types of layouts. You have a traditional layout um, that, um, that we would go to most warehouses that we would see. All the costs associated with the transactions uh, include things like transportation, storage, finding and moving material, outgoing transport, and of course all, this, all the facilitating items like equipment, people, material, supervision, etc. You want to minimize damage and spoilage. Obsolescence, not only that, you want, um, you want to minimize the likelihood of pilferage as well. Some of the things that to consider as well um, is that warehouse density tends to vary inversely with the number of items stored. So if you have a large number of items stored and those items have different sizes and different shapes, you tend not to maximize the utilization of your space. Just think of if you have a single item and you would fill an entire warehouse with it, you certainly can do that. But then if you now turn around and you're storing a thousand different items, they all have different sizes and shapes, and so therefore you end up with a lot of space that is not utilized. Okay? Um, automated storage and retrieval systems um, help to improve the sort of throughput capabilities of a warehouse. Uh, as well, it is very important that you know where the dock is located because of the inflow and outflow from that facility. So that's, that becomes very important. Okay? And this is uh, your traditional warehouse lo um, location, um, layout with a bunch of racks and so on. But when you get into things like um, cross-docking, the layout is, uh, is a bit different. A fixed position layout, if you look, um, for example, uh, a patient in a hospital, well, that patient is fixed. You don't move them around to different locations. Um, so when they're receiving service, so you bring all the equipment and personnel to them. Product remains in one place. Workers and equipment come to the site. You have some complicating factors, such as limited space at the site, different materials required at different stages of the product, of the project that has to be brought in. And the volume of materials needed is dynamic. It changes. Sometimes you need a lot. Sometimes you need a little. Uh, Process-oriented layouts. Basically, you think of like a hospital. We've already mentioned that. Um, so in a case like that, you think of the fact that you may have different types of products that have to be processed. But each of them have their own movement through the facility. And so... Maybe from the studying of some history of, uh, of different types of products, you could figure out where, which are some, um, some highly related processes that you could put together. But um, 
generally you want some flexibility in how you lay out that facility because you don't know your product mix can vary from time to time. So like machines and equipment are grouped together, the ones that are similar in nature, that makes sense. So like, you know, all of the milling machines, all of the drilling machines, all the painting, uh, all the deburring, you know, all of those things um, are grouped together, okay? If you think about uh, a service uh, environment, tires in one section, alignment in another section, uh, maybe um, uh, engine repair in another section. So if you have a multi-service facility, you would actually group those services uh, as well, okay? So the process-oriented layout is flexible, capable of handling a wide variety of products or services. Scheduling can be difficult, setup material handling, and labor costs can be quite high. So here's an example, ER, surgery, radiology, ER beds, pharmacy, billing, laboratories, emergency room admissions. So that's very much a, a process-oriented layout in a hospital. This I found quite interesting. This is the Arnold Palmer Hospital. And here, look at the layout. It's quite interesting. You have here, it looks like a spaceship. Uh, you have a central nursing station, but also you have a local nursing station right here. Local nursing pods. And what's interesting is by having this circular arrangement, although you don't get the nice uh, square nature of a room, but what happens is that you minimize the travel in to and out of the rooms. So that you give up some of that kind of space for having that importance of flow. So you have all the linen uh, placed right here. You have uh, central break and medical supply rooms right here, over in this area right here. And I'm not sure what this section is, but clearly this looks like a really innovative um, kind of a layout. And then you have these pie-shaped rooms with that as well. The process-oriented layout, I think we've already talked about that, uh, arrange the work center so as to minimize the cost of material handling. And the basic cost elements are the number of loads of people moving between centers and the distance the loads actually need to travel to move between the centers. In a process-oriented layout, because we're trying to minimize travel between locations, we could actually formulate a mathematical model to help us figure this out, where you would have the number of loads move from one department to another department, that's XIJ, and this is the cost. And your whole objective is to minimize that cost. And you do have models that allow us to be able to, um, to accomplish that, all right? I just want to show you that if you think about this whole idea of flow between locations, if you create a matrix that shows the from to relationship between um, two departments, you can gather the information on the amount of travel multiplied by the volume of material moved between them. And then you can sort of create an initial layout where you put the um, departments together and in that initial layout, you could kind of draw a flow diagram that shows, a flow graph that shows you how the um, values are between the two. So, for example, assembly, if you look at assembly and machine, the flow between those two is 100. So those two need to come together. Look at the next big one, 50, between painting and receiving. 50 here as well. Now, this is only one level away, so that's not too bad. So I'd say the big change that you want to look at is if you look at testing a machine, those need to be close, but somehow we need to get assembly and machine a little closer together. So here's an alternate uh, uh, flow, which, is, which brings about some improvement. So if we were to take assembly, move it in here, and move painting back here, we see now we are still able to keep that 50 relationship, keep that 50 relationship in here, and that 100 uh, score now is a lot closer, and this is a lot closer. So you could sort of sort of move around, uh, you know, in a heuristic fashion, move the departments around a little bit until you find a total value of flow that is as small as possible. 
you can optimize it using software, or you certainly can um, just sort of do a man take a manual approach to this. Okay. Work cells. Uh, work cells reorganizes people and machines into groups to focus on a single product or a group of products that are very similar in nature. So we use something called group technology. What group technology does is that it, it will take a number of parts or products and identify similarities between them and suggest that they be grouped together. And um, if you have sufficient volume and a number of parts that are similar in design concept, you could bring those and actually have a group of workers work on them at the same time. So you get some uh, pretty good advantages that comes out of that. You reduce working process inventory. You use less floor space. Um, reduce material and finished goods inventory, reduce direct labor. But again, just uh, because you are now producing these multiple products that are similar in nature, so you get some benefits from that because the workers could work on all these varieties of parts. So you get a cross-functional team working on these products, making it a lot easier to get uh, throughput uh, from them. So that's why you have things like reduced labor, the inventory levels go down because they share common parts and so forth. All right? It increases the um, use of, uh, of equipment and machinery and actually reduces the need for investment in additional equipment. All right? Some of the requirements of work sales, identification of families and products. We already said that. High level of training because you want your employees to be flexible. It's typically a self-contained unit. And then you want to make sure that you don't uh, have mistakes happening at each workstation, so you do pokeyoks, um, which you may recall from quality management, which is um, foolproofing of the facility okay, as much as possible. So these are just some examples of some potential layouts. You can see here one apparent layout where two workers are in closed areas. All right? They don't see each other, they don't talk to each other, but you could actually bring them together in this sort of a slightly uh, curved shape layout. They're cross-trained and they could actually help each other out when they need be. Okay? There's another one where you have workers in a straight line, makes it hard for them to talk to each other and balance the, their workloads, but you could actually improve that if um, you, you now have somebody here have, have exposure to a larger number of machines or, 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 or tasks right here in this U-shape. So it's much better for access. So for Christian workers, will reduce with this layout compared to a street line layout. So U-shape may reduce employee movement and space requirements while enhancing communication, reducing the number of workers and facilitating inspection. So they come with their advantages, but they also have some disadvantages as well. In terms of repetitive and product-oriented layouts, so think about the assembly line or manufacturing bear. Those things have the layout to facilitate the nature of the product. So usually you have high volumes that you're producing, and then you could then create this sort of um, repetitive and product-oriented layouts. So volume is adequate for, in the case of organizing, high volume, low variety. Volume is adequate for high volume equipment or high equipment utilization. Product demand is stable so that you don't have a lot of variation and then you have a fairly consistent demand level. You don't want these um, highly volatile up and down swings where you know one minute your machines are very highly utilized another minute that they sit sitting idle. The product is fairly standardized so it could go for the same set of steps um, over and over again and supplies of raw materials and components are adequate and uniform in quality so you don't have to be interrupting your line uh, very often. So you have a fabrication line if you're fabricating a product the fabrication is done the machines actually will dictate how things are done. Um, so you're fabricating, you might actually need to take the part and, and cast it in one location, extrude it in another location, um, drill it in another location. So you have, um, these are fabrication tasks. And so you build components on a series of machines. The machines uh, is paste and requires mechanical or engineering changes to balance things. An assembly line puts the fabricated parts, so now that you have fabricated parts, such as if you're making a bicycle, then you have a handlebar, some wheels, the spokes, the gears, the seats. So those are parts that have already been fabricated, and they are put together at a series of workstations. So the task is what actually they, uh, pace how work is done, and you balance the line by moving the tasks 
um, between the workstations by combining workstations and moving the tasks into different um, uh, workstations. All right. So both types of lines must be balanced so that the time to perform the work on each station is approximately the same so that you don't have bottlenecks developing in this case. All right. Some of the advantages uh, of uh, product-oriented layouts, low variable cost per unit, low material handling costs, reduced working process, easier training and supervision, and rapid throughput. However, high volume is required. Work stoppage at any time ties up the entire operation, and there's not a lot of flexibility in those types of operations. Let's just quickly look here. You can see even at McDonald's in the kitchen, you have an assembly line operation, and that is a, a layout that suits the fact that McDonald's is actually assembling products for you, burgers, the bread, the beef patty, the vegetables that go on, the condiments and whatnot. So all of that is actually part of a repetitive layout for McDonald's and we see the various steps and the time it takes to actually complete that. Last but not least, in as much as we talk about assembly of parts, well, nowadays with sustainability, we are now getting into the disassembly of parts. And so after the product is produced, so then hence you have this whole field now called design for disassembly, where in creating a product, the designers are now thinking about how can you make the disassembling of that product relatively easy and painless when the time comes to do so. So disassembly is being considered in new product designs, Green issues and recycling standards are important considerations, and the automotive disassembly is the 16th largest industry in the U.S. So a lot of folks who run these salvage yards have to disassemble products all across the U.S. and Canada, as you can see. So disassembly is getting just as important as assembly operations.